practical study for you as well. And we looked at a few things last time, understanding a little bit about the origin of sin. Uh, but tonight we'll look at a couple of things that will hopefully be a help to you as well. Number one, there's the consequences of sin. When it comes to the consequences of sin, there's several different things that we know in the scriptures uh, about the consequences of sin. Sin came into the way. Understand when God created the world, when God created the universe, it was sinless. There was no sin in it. That was a part of it. Uh, but we understand that things broke, and we see that uh, letter A there, uh, the consequences of sin upon Lucifer. When it came to sin entering into our universe, it came in that spot in heaven, actually, where Lucifer decided to sin against Almighty God. Uh, we think about the consequences of sin. We remember that it broke creation. Uh, when it comes to sin specifically, it employed the angels in accomplishing something that God had for them to do. Uh, we understand when it came to uh, the consequences of sin, we remember that it started a great creative work of God. God created everything initially, but then because of mankind's sin, God then started a second work of recreation, if you will. Uh, and we call this the uh, plan of redemption that God has for us. And so there are some consequences that were related to sin itself. And we think about the consequences of sin. Let's think specifically about what were the consequences of sin for at least two specific groups. The first one tonight we look is the consequences upon Lucifer. Number one, when it comes to Lucifer himself, he lost his position as heaven's anointed cherub and became earth's depraved dragon. We see that in the scriptures in Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of the fire. We've looked at this verse actually several times, almost every week, like the last three or four weeks now, because we studied Satan a few weeks ago, and as we understood more about Satan, and now as we look at the subject of sin, we can see the devil's part in creating uh, sin and the consequences of sin. But when it came to his position, remember, he was the anointed chair. He was the one who was in charge. When it came to the crowning point of all of creation, I know we like to think it was us, but it wasn't us. The crowning point of all creation was Lucifer. Lucifer was the anointed chair. He's the one who everybody else looked up to. He's the one who all the other angels came to for help, I guess, if they needed it. When it came to life, everything pretty much revolved around, yes, the throne of God, but when it came to the orderliness of heaven, Lucifer was a huge part of that. When it came to Lucifer himself, he became earth's depraved dragon. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against who? The dragon and the dragon fought against his angels. Now, we dealt with that several weeks ago, and I don't think we fully comprehend how much spiritual battle there is going on in our world. But we understand that when the devil fell, when Satan, when Lucifer fell, he became that great dreaded dragon. But number two, we learn about Lucifer. He will someday, we rejoiced about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, he will someday spend eternity in a lake of fire. Now, when it comes to people, we don't rejoice about other people spending eternity in the lake of fire. But when it comes to the origin of sin and what it is that the devil has done to us, how many of you are going to rejoice someday? I don't know if we get to pass it. He'll be chained and we get to pass him around. I don't know what it's going to be like, but somehow he was going to be cast into the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41. Then, he shall, uh, then shall he say also unto them on the left, uh, uh, left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. We understand, understand when it comes to this everlasting fire, here's what it says. It's prepared for the devil and his Angels. So all these demonic creatures and Lucifer himself are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.10 sums it up well. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And he shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How many of you have had enough of the devil? Right? And uh, we think about this passage and it reminds us that just like the devil has tormented you every day. Someday he is going to be tormented in the flames of the lake of fire forever and ever. Now, we think about sin and original sin, how the devil really ushered it into the universe because of his rebellion. But let's also understand the very fact that through his rebellion and then also mankind's rebellion, not just having an 
uh, sinfulness in the spiritual world and also now being introduced into our physical world, realize that you and I are sinners as well. We have chosen to sin. And so that's the second category today, uh, the consequences of sin, not just upon Lucifer, upon which we celebrate, but understand that there are also conditions or consequences that we face upon man or mankind tonight as well. One of the things that we understand in the first place is this. Upon mankind, there is physical death. You say, what is physical death? Physical death is this. It is separation of the body and soul. Uh, Genesis 2, 17. You remember how in the Garden of Eden, it was said of this way, but of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, God said, thou shalt surely do it. Die. Die. God said that they were going to die, and mankind was going to die in the day that they ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Can I even say 930 years is a long time? Can any of you imagine living 930 years? That seems like a really long time, doesn't it? But Adam lived 930 years, but he can catch this. He's still not living today. Do you know why? Because there's three words at the end of the verse I didn't read. And he... Die. Catch that? Mankind does not live an eternal life here on this earth, but we realize that because of sinfulness that there is a physical death that comes to us. In fact, Psalm 90, verse number 10, you say, how long do we live? Well, the days of our years are three, four years and ten. So it's about 70, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, that's 80, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we, I like these words, we fly away. Right, here we go. You know, we go from this life to the next. It's a separation of the uh, soul and the body. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Of course, we think about death, and so many times we focus specifically on that of physical death. But there's also something else, not just physical, but also spiritual death. That's the second thing. Uh, spiritual death. This is separation of the soul from God. So it's not just separation of the body and the soul, and, and soul, but it's separation of the soul from God. The reason is, is because, uh, and by the way, this is a spiritual death for all who are unsaved. Did you catch that? This is separation. We refer to this in the Word of God as the second death. Um, it's not just physical death. Everybody dies, right? But later on, there's a second death where people are separated from God for all of eternity. Matthew 7. Verse 22 and 23. By the way, if you haven't done this, mark these verses in your Bible. These are the scariest verses in the Bible. Matthew 7, 22. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Here's verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that were iniquity. So many people in this world think they're doing a lot of good things, and they think that when they stand before God, that somehow God is going to usher them into heaven just because they've been doing good things, or they've been even going to church, or they've been giving the offering, or they've been teaching a Sunday school class, or singing in the choir, or whatever the list is, going on and on and on and on. But we remember, when it comes to people who are unsaved, they're going to be separated from God for all of eternity in, in, in this sense. How many of you know a policeman? Okay, I like to illustrate it this way. Uh, now... There are two different ways you can treat a policeman, okay, right? Policeman is if, if you have problems, you can run to the policeman, right? But there are some people in this world, when they see a policeman, when they do, they go running from the policeman, okay? This is the relationship when it comes to spiritual death. The Word of God reminds us that God is everywhere. We understand when it comes to heaven, when it comes to hell, when it comes to God's creation. Let's remember this, in the relationship that people have with God Almighty, at knowing God, He is our Heavenly Father. We have a close relationship with Him. But we call out to Him, we, crawl, we call out, Abba, Father, we want to be close to Him. But when it comes to this eternal place of judgment, God is the eternal tormentor, if you will. He is the eternal judge. He is the one who is uh, casting this damnation upon these people because of their sinfulness, because they have rejected the way of salvation. So understand when it comes to this eternal spiritual death, it is for those who are unsaved. Revelation 20, verse number 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. And on the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. What he's speaking of specifically in Revelation 26 is for those of you and I who are saved. 
if you know Jesus as your Savior, yes, you may die, but you only die once. Because you'll always be with the Lord. But he's specifically identifying this because Revelation 21 8 shows us, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Then he says this, which is the second death. This is a second separation, if you will, not just a first earthly physical death, but it's also a spiritual death and separation. From a loving, holy presence before God. So we can see here there's the physical death. And secondly, there's the spiritual death. So there are some great consequences. If, if I can say it this way, some great consequences for sin. But secondly, we understand this idea. And we praise the Lord for it. The idea of the imputation of sin. The imputation of sin. And I say praise the Lord for it. Especially when we get to the end of where we're going to be looking. When it comes to the imputation. And we say, what is imputation? Everybody say, imputation. Okay, this is nothing to do with computation. Okay? We're not dealing with a computer right now. We're talking about imputation. So what is imputation? We learn about it. So letter A is the definition of imputation. The definition of imputation. Let me give this definition to you. It says this. To impute is the act of one person adding something, good or bad, to the account of of another person. Okay, now, oftentimes, let's just kind of be honest, when we talk about imputation, we usually think about it in the positive. When it comes to the idea where the term of imputation, it really carries with it the positive or the negative. So we look at it and understand when it comes to the imputations, adding something good or bad to the account of another person. If you will, imagine that each and every one of you have an account. Some people add to your account, some people take away from your account. Okay, so with that idea in mind, think about this. Letter B, there are three kinds of imputation. The first one is this. The, number, the imputation of Adam's sin upon the human race. How many of you say that to be positive? How many of you say that to be negative? Obviously, we say it's a negative imputation. The reason why uh, you are a sinner, the reason why there are consequences for your sin is because of this. Because of Adam's sin, the imputation of his sin has been given to you. Uh, that's why the question comes up, why do I have to be saved? Well, you're a sinner because Adam's sin has been imputed to your account as well. You need to be saved because you are a sinner just like Adam was a sinner. Uh, we looked at Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So there's the, the principle of imputation of Adam's sin. Number two is the imputation of the race's sin upon Christ. Think about this. When it comes to Jesus Christ, uh, we can see that uh, he, uh, our sin was placed upon him. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for whose transgressions? Ours. He was bruised for whose iniquities? Ours. Uh, he says the chastisement of whose peace was upon him? Ours. And with his stripes, we are healed. When it comes to Jesus saving us, when it comes to his account, understand that he took upon himself willingly our sin. You catch that? He took our sin upon himself. Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. We studied the angels not too long ago. But think about this. The angels are still scratching their head, thinking God would make himself lower than the angels. Why, why would he do that? Well, Hebrews 2 9 tells us why. Because he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. This is why. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Taking your sin and his sin being placed, uh, our sin being placed upon him. 1 Peter 2, 4. Who his own self bear whose sins? Our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. And he says this, by whose stripes ye were healed. So, number three. The imputation of God's righteousness upon the believing sinner. The imputation of God's righteousness upon the the believing sinner. Now, I, I illustrated some of this uh, not too long, uh, too long ago. At Christmas time, I like to say this. God the Son became a son of man, so the sons of men could become the sons of God. See how that works? Okay, so this is the principle of imputation. 
If you were just born into this world, you are a sinner. But because of Jesus Christ and his work, he says, I take your sin upon myself. And guess what? I don't just take your sin, but I take my righteousness and I give it to you. Isn't that an amazing thing? Now, you say sin is a terrible subject. You're right, it is. Except for the very fact that in the process of sin, if you will, in our lives, that Jesus has done an amazing thing. It is this. He has taken his righteousness and he's given it to you. Now, just look around. Peruse the auditorium just for a second. I know you're wondering who was here anyway, right? So kind of look over your soul, shoulder and see. Now, do they look like sinners or do they look like righteous people? Some look okay, but I know it's a little rough on Wednesday. I don't know. Uh, but you look around. Think about this. We are all sinners. Right. But praise the Lord because of the great work of Jesus Christ. When God sees you right now, those of you who are in this auditorium, you know Jesus as your Savior. You're on your way to heaven. You say, I've blown it. I've sinned. I've said something. I did something. I went somewhere. I, I, you list it, okay? You don't have to say it all out loud right now. We don't want to celebrate it. But understand this. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, as God sees you tonight, he doesn't see your sinfulness. What does he see? He sees his righteousness. Isn't that awesome? That's the one thing that will that'll make the Lutheran shout. Amen? Okay? When it comes to being excited about the work of God, let's praise God for what he's done. He is, we get to celebrate his forgiving power and righteousness in our lives. So number three, did I give that one to you? The imputation of God's righteousness upon the believing sinner. The believing sinner. You catch that? The believing sinner. So in this sense, it's not like I have to go to church in order to be righteous. I don't have to make hospital visits to be righteous. I don't have to help my neighbor to be righteous. I don't have to help somebody to be... No, no, no. Uh, in fact, the more that I try to do that... Without Jesus, the farther I'm getting from it. So how do I get it? Believe me. I trust in his righteousness that it can be mine. That he does this exchange where he takes my sin because he's paid for it. He takes his righteousness and he gives it to me. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God... Without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. Then he says this, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. Praise the Lord for that. There is no difference. You know why? It wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for people living in first century uh, Rome. It's available to you and to me today. Salvation is available to everybody. So when it comes to salvation, praise the Lord for the great work that Christ has done, the imputation of God's righteousness upon the believing sin. Have you believed? That's the question tonight. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you trusted in him? Or are you trying to get to heaven your way? Let me ask you which one's going to work. Your way or God's way? Let's do it God's way. Letter C. The classic example of imputation. Take your Bible, look over Philippians. Sorry, not Philippians. Philemon. Philemon, chapter number 1. Okay, so Philemon, we're going to read verses 10 through 19. We look at Philemon, and this is like the classic example of imputation in scriptures. It helps us to understand this great, great Bible truth. Philemon 1. I like the second half of the New Testament is probably the way to describe it to you. Well, Philemon 1, or you have the table of contents in the front of your Bible, right? So I'd be like, where is this? This is not a very big book, so you may have passed it a couple of times. Philemon 1, and we're going to start reading in verse number 10. We'll go down to verse number 19. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that they may be sincere and without offense till the day of... Oops, that's Philippians. I'm not even there. <laughs> Look at that. I know. I know. Well, I got it all right here. Okay. I have it printed out on my sheet. I beseech thee... Some of you like, Pastor see, even makes a mistake. I will admit it, okay? I do. Uh, I beseech thee for my son, who, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing. That thy benefit should not be as if, as if it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, 
that, there should, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he has wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. I want you to think about this story. It's kind of the, the classic example of communication for a couple of different reasons. These are in your notes, but I'll mention a few things to you. When it comes to Onesimus, thinking about who Onesimus was, he was a slave. And when it came to Roman culture, it was not uncommon for people to be slaves. Uh, in many ways, it was similar to the American slavery, but in many ways, it was very different than American slavery as well. Uh, in many ways, it was different because of this. If you had a debt, it was not unusual for you to enter into being a slave by which you would uh, basically earn a wage until your debt was paid, and then you would go back into freedom. Okay? Or you've heard some people chose to be slaves the rest of their lives, and they had their ear pierced, and they had a ring, or an earring put in, and they stayed with their master. They chose to do so. And so there's different culture when it came to the day and age of what we think. We usually go back to early American uh, history, and we think everything was like that. It wasn't always like that, okay? Uh, it was a little different when it came to those things. But when it came to Philemon, he was a wealthy Colossian believer, and he was also uh, a friend of the Apostle Paul. And when it came to Onesimus, he robbed his master and he ran away. So here's the slave, and for why he was a slave, we don't know exactly. He was paying a debt off or what the case was, and he basically took something and he ran away with it, and he disappeared. He split town. Now, in the providence of God, this is what's really, really cool, Onesimus and the apostle Paul met up. And of course, Onesimus and Paul met up, and they started they start a friendship. The, the gospel penetrated the heart of Onesimus, and come to find out, Onesimus was a slave of one of the Apostle Paul's friends. And through that, all these connections are made. And so here, this letter, the letter of, uh, is written to Philemon about this slave and trying to explain what was going on. By God's grace, Onesimus' path crosses with the Apostle Paul, resulting, resulting in his salvation. Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, though, and this letter is being sent with Onesimus. Okay? So here it is. Slave saved. He's headed back to his owner, if you will, or uh, the one who's uh, ruling his life at this moment in time. And this letter is there to uh, prepare uh, the way for Philemon uh, to accept Onesimus when he comes back. Now that, what has happened? Philemon is a Christian. Onesimus is a Christian. Doesn't make things really, really interesting. It used to be Slave, owner, slave. But here we go. Here's the relationship in Jesus Christ. Now they are brothers in Christ, right? Okay? So you kind of get the, the, these, uh, these parallels that the Apostle Paul is showing. The Apostle Paul appeal, he appeals to Philemon to add the damages caused by Onesimus to the Apostle Paul's account. Okay, so Onesimus had run away with whatever he stole with from Philemon, and the Apostle Paul's over here, and he's saying this, hey, whatever it is that he stole, put it on my account. Okay, remember the idea of imputation? That's what he's saying right here. He says, put that on my account. And of course, you can see what happens now. Why? Because as the Apostle Paul had come into town, he had preached the gospel in Colossae, and that is why Philemon trusted Christ as his Savior. Now, hold on a second. You see all kinds of relationships here, don't you? The Apostle Paul made a spiritual and significant impact in the life of Philemon and Onesimus. And now because of what's going on, the Apostle Paul reminds Philemon about this. Hey, Philemon, if I had not preached the gospel to you, you'd still be lost. And on that account, in verse number 19, is why he says those words right there. He says, I, Paul... I have written with mine own hand, I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou, oughtest, how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. When it came to this relationship, we remember that Onesimus, he kind of owed things to his slave owner. But when it came to the slave owner, he owed everything to the Apostle Paul. Catch that? And of course the Apostle Paul, he owed everything to Jesus Christ. 
When it came to these relationships, we understand this idea of imputation, this principle that's shown to us in the scripture and how it is so, so, so powerful. So imputation of sin. Here's a classic example of what it is that Christ has done for us. Sunday I'm going to preach on that topic. Anyway, Roman numeral three. Why do Christians sin? You ever wonder why you're why you're uh, why you sin? You're like, Pastor, we get to the notes. I'm going to try to fly. Okay, <laughs> I promise. Uh, why do Christians sin? You say I'm a Christian, right? Uh, and you wonder why is it you sin? Don't you have Jesus in your heart? Do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Is God all powerful? Well, if God's all powerful, why do you still sin? You ever kind of play these mind games? And uh, we kind of wrestle every day. How I many of you are sinners? Oh, let me back up. How I many of you are saved and you are a sinner too? Okay? That's all of us. We, we wrestle with this thing called sin. And by the way, you're going to. Um, and so why is it that we sin? Letter A. Because of our sin nature. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I know you look at your baby picture and you say, oh, wasn't I cute? But guess what? You were a cute sinner. Okay, and uh, you're still a cute sinner. Okay, when it comes to life, remember that you are a sinner. Secondly, because of satanic temptation, First Peter five eight. Remember, the apostle Peter writing this as a Christian, he dealt with the devil pretty regularly. Remember, the devil wanted to sift him as wheat. Even Jesus told Peter, "Get thee behind me." What was the name? Satan. Can you imagine being called Satan? Sometimes Christians act like the devil. We look at the scripture, and, and because of satanic temptation, we face a lot of the, the devil doesn't like it when we do the right thing. Because it helps the testimony of the gospel. Let her see. Why do Christians sin? Because it appears exciting. Is sin fun? Yes or no? It is. If sin wasn't fun, you wouldn't do it. Right? right? Is it a temptation for you to get a root canal? No, it's not a sin to go get a tent on a root canal, right? But it is a sin to, I mean, you build a life. There's all kinds of things that we like to, to sin. Uh, but it is exciting. Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, uh, talking about Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There's the example. Uh, letter D, because of spiritual ignorance. Spiritual ignorance. Remember the verse we started out with? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know why a lot of Christians sin? Because we're not in the word of God. A lot of times we sin because we don't know what we're supposed to do or we ignore the truth that we already know. Um, so there's uh, this part, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because we're rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, if you're not in the word of God, that's going to make you to be an ignorant person. That's why one of the reasons, one of our biggest ministries we have here at Open Door Baptist Church, we organize things around our Sunday school. That's one of the reasons why we have a Christian school. That's one of the reasons why we have a daycare. You know why we do that? To help people to not just be here. They're not going to get the same spiritual influence sitting in a public school classroom as what they're going to get here. And so when it comes to helping people to know the truth of the scripture, that's why we do what we do. So that people can hear the word of God, so they can rightly divide the word of God, so they can apply the word of God to their lives. Because so many people sin because they are ignorant of spiritual truth. Letter E. Because it is a habit. A habit. Is it possible? I'll be honest, I've heard sermons about this. Is it that... That say that Christians can't not get into the habit of sinning. Is that the practical experience and the same practice that you have? No. We all sin. And there are certain things. In fact, the uh, Apostle Paul alludes to this. That there is a sin uh, that's easy for us to trip up on. Oftentimes. We have to make sure that when it comes to those sins that we learn that there are things, some things in our lives that may be a habit. And we have to overcome those habits. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, 1. No, we ought not to. Uh, but oftentimes things can become a habit. Roman number 4. What must Christians do with sin? Well, if we're going to overcome the sins in our lives, letter A, you know this one, we must confess it. Confess it. When you're sinning, you need to admit that you are doing wrong. That's the first step in trying to overcome any specific sin. What does God say about it? In fact, that's what the idea of confess means. It means to agree with God. If you don't agree with God, then it's really hard to confess it. And by the way, this is not just the Lord, please forgive my sins. 
You ever done that before? You come to the end of a long day and you think, man, I'm just really, really tired. And you think, I know I need to confess my sins to the Lord and try to keep a short account with God. The Bible says, let not set uh, your anger go down uh, upon your wrath. I can't remember exactly how that goes, but you know the verse. Okay, so when it comes to that, you're like, okay, the principle is I need to confess my sins today, not carry today's problems into tomorrow. And so, Lord, just would you just please forgive all my sins today? That doesn't quite fit. You need to agree with God. You need to admit to God that what it is that you have done wrong. Um, that's important. So, what does God say? By the way, don't ask the world what they say. Don't ask your flesh what it says. But certainly don't ask the devil what he says. Make sure you agree with what God says. Letter B, we need to forsake it. Forsake it. So not, not just confess it, but also forsake it. Isaiah 55 Seven, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return, we're supposed to go return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We shouldn't be afraid to go to God to confess our sin. He wants us to come. He invites us to be able to come. Uh, as I know sometimes, humanly, we don't like to confess our sins to other people because of the embarrassment, those types of things. But God already knows. So when it comes to confessing, don't be afraid. Uh, in fact, there's a song. Do it now. Don't be late. Don't put it off. Do another day. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, so when it comes to that's an old Patch, Patch the Pirate song. <laughs> they may remember Patch the Pirate and uh, along the way uh, there. But uh, don't delay. So many times we procrastinate. That's another song. Procrastinate. Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to our sin, let's make sure that we forsake the sin. Let's let her see. We need to learn to hate. Everybody say hate it. The more you hate sin, the less you're going to get involved. The problem is we like to pick and choose. We see sins in other people's lives that may not be a temptation for us, and those are the sins we hate. But then there are other temptations in our lives that are like, oh, I really don't hate this one. So we need to learn how to hate sin. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord. Doesn't the Bible say we're supposed to fear God? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of Wisdom. The Bible says that in Proverbs, but Proverbs 8.13 says this. The fear of the Lord practically is to hate evil. He says pride and arrogance in the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. God says he hates it. And if God hates it, it's probably a good indication that we should hate something too. Don't say pastor. I thought we're a Christian. We're not supposed to hate anything. That is not true. There's a lot of things we're supposed to hate. Anything that stands up in the way of uh, our, our uh, progress and our walk with God, guess what? We're supposed to hate those things. We're supposed to make sure that we're walking uh, in Christ. So we need to hate those things. Uh, uh, Amos 5.15. God says this. Hate the evil. Everybody say that. Hate the evil. Are you hating evil? Now, on the flip side, there's something else. We're not supposed to just hate the evil, but we're supposed to love the good. And establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Basically, this verse says this. We're supposed to be good at discerning what's good and what's evil. Are you establishing good judgment in your life? What? Pastor, we're not supposed to judge. You see how when it comes to the subject of sin, how it really invades so many of these territories in our lives. And we just kind of like to push away so we can justify or say a little bit, don't judge me. You know, somebody says, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't judge me. Right? That's what we do. Do you know why? For this very reason, the same reason that Adam and Eve ran when, G, when the Lord came to the, the garden. Adam, where are you? He hid. Do you know why? He didn't want to be judged of God. Why did Eve hide? Why did they make these, these clothes out of fig leaves? Because they didn't want to be judged for being naked. They weren't supposed to be. Well... Could have been. God created them that way. But all of a sudden they realize it. Like, whoo, something different. I feel a breeze today. I don't know what's going on. No, I don't know. Yeah, so all of a sudden it's like all, God trying to work through this. He's trying to remind us we're supposed to hate sin. But as we hate sin, it's because we're making a good judgment about life. What's truly going on? Do you know what the problem is with all the stuff that's going on in the news and in people's lives right now? There's all kinds of opinions. We're making all kinds of judgments, but we're not coming back to the truth. And we're not discerning what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. 
Hey, every one of these issues, gun control, more guns, less guns, all this kind of, it comes back to a heart situation. What's the condition of the person? What's the condition of all these things that are going on in our world? We need to make sure that we deal with the person more than dealing with the circumstances. This is all, all this other stuff, all these circumstances that are going on in the world, these are things that are peripheral to the heart issue of mankind, which is mankind is a sinner. Some of you are teachers. You know that. You teach them every day in your classroom, don't you? Some of you are parents. You realize your kids are just like you or like your spouse, right, when it comes to this. So when it comes to life, we need to remember uh, that sin, we need to hate it. Letter D, don't just hate it, overcome it. Overcome it. Romans 12, 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So when you want to think something bad or do something bad or say something bad, guess what you're supposed to do? Jesus, I need your help right now. I want to fill the blank and say, God, help me to do the right thing. Help me to choose to make the right choice here. So, we need to learn to overcome sin. By the way, you cannot live sinlessly. You're not going to. That's why, let's go back to letter A, we need to learn to confess it and forsake it and hate it and continue to strive to, what's the last one? Overcome it. Remember number five, you ever ask this question, why in the world, why, why did God choose to allow sin to be in this world? Wouldn't life be so much easier if there wasn't such a thing as sin? What if he just never even made up rules that there was a such thing as sin? Then whatever we do, we'd be fine. But there's a reason. We start to look at the scriptures, we ask this question, why did God allow sin? Letter A, kind of a long answer there. God created man and angels as intelligent creatures. You and I were created to be intelligent, meaning this, we think, we feel, we make decisions. You know the number one thing you do every day is you make decisions? You really do. Now, you make micro decisions all the time. Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? Am I going to go here? Am I going to go here? How am I going to drive? Uh, am I going to go fast? Am I going to go slow? You know, you're making decisions all the time. Am I going to stop at this restaurant or that restaurant? Am I going to use this pencil or that pen? Am I going to use that pen? You're making decisions all the time. You're right now, you're making decisions. Am I going to listen to this crazy preacher? Right? When it comes to thinking, you are an intelligent person. God created you to be able to think so that you could determine and choose between right and wrong. God stopped Lucifer. Had God stopped Lucifer and Adam one second before their sin, he would, in effect, have violated their moral natures and reduced them to mere walking robots. You are not a robot. God didn't just kind of put a punch card into you. and You have the ability to choose. And because you have the ability to choose, that opened up another door for something to happen. This is something, that, this is the wonderful part of sin. If I can say sin is not wonderful, but this is the door that sin opened. Let her be. God allowed man to sin in part. I'm not saying this is the whole reason. But one of the reasons why God allowed sin is so that he might display his grace. Did you catch that? The backdrop of sin that God creates, the overriding principle that helps in every sinful condition in the wickedness and the heart of mankind, and even in Lucifer that will one day be destroyed in the lake of fire, is this, God's great grace. Where there is no sin, there is no need of grace. Romans 5.20, moreover, the law in entered that the grace might abound. He says, where, but where sin abounded, the Bible says this, grace did much more abound. Okay, that means it wasn't a little bit, that means it was a lot of it. That's the grace that God wants you to know. We look at Ephesians 2.5 and Ephesians 2.7. Even when we were dead in sins, God had quickened us together with Christ. He says, by grace... Ye are saved. Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, this is the grace of God in the ages to come, not right now, but in the ages to come, for all of eternity, while we're in heaven, this is what God's going to do. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's the work that Jesus does. He says, so why is God allowed sin? 
that God's great grace can also be displayed in your life. Isn't that an amazing thing? Amen. The blessing of God is great. The work of God is great. So here's a question for you before we close in prayer. This. Are you a display of God's grace? Think about that. Are you a display of God's grace? That, does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. But you know Christ is your Savior. And are you exhibiting God's grace today so that other people can see that grace now and in all of eternity? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your great grace. I thank you for saving us, for at least giving us opportunity of salvation. Your display of grace is abundant and is available to all. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight, under the sound of my voice, under the preaching of your word, that can see in the truth of the scriptures, that they would know this truth, that Jesus Christ loves them despite their sinfulness, and he wants them to be saved. But I ask you to draw people to know Christ. May the gospel shine its riches forever and ever and ever in our lives as we trust you, and then as we follow you in this life, as we display your great grace to come in the ages beyond. We want to thank you for what you've done tonight, what you're going to do in our lives. Help us to display your great grace this evening and each and every day that we live. As we trust you and as we follow you. Dismiss us with your blessed Lord tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you all have a great night tonight. Looking forward to our Sunday uh, study as well. We uh, uh, look at uh, starting out in Psalm 119 and actually looking at verse number 11 will be one of the verses we look at. Asking this question, how can we be and uh, so let me encourage you to invite some friends to be with us for our service on Sunday. And hope you all have a great night and a great rest of the week. God bless you all.